diseases, but by the time I'm done, hopefully some of you will at least consider it. Um, because this huge mess uh, that we're in, the fact that you're all sitting in your own bedroom instead of together in a lecture hall, you know, it's very regrettable, it's very preventable, and my hope is that if we get brilliant minds like all of you working on this, we can never ever have to go through this again. We always start lectures about conflicting interests. How do you know that your speaker is a trusted source? For example, if someone is talking about a scientific instrument, are they a stockholder in that corporation, pharmaceutics as well? Uh, I do infectious disease, so I have no such interests. I have many conflicting interests. I'm interested in elevating the level of care at our hospital. I'm interested in education. I'm a professor, so I teach our young physicians how to become great infectious disease doctors. I am interested in climbing mountains. I'm interested in spending time with my very happy family. Uh, but yeah, no financial conflicts of, of interest with what you'll hear today. The one disclosure is that there is a book called The Plague Year. It was published a week or two ago written by Lawrence Wright. It's very good. Uh, I do recommend it as recommended reading for all Americans, but certainly if you're interested in this topic, I think it's a good one to read. Now, my I was interviewed for this book. My emails, texts are in there, etc., but I am not paid for it, so it's not actually a conflict of interest. I think he handled it very well. And If you want more detail about the political mistakes and the disaster when politics messes with science, which it always does, this is a great starting point. So my objectives, let's talk about the timeline of COVID, how we got to where we are, but really just to appreciate those countermeasures that we have, what we have today, and perhaps an eye towards scientific advancement moving forward. This is a chance for us to think as scientists, like you are all scientists, to think about how you intersect with politics, class dynamics, and economics through the lens of pandemic. We could do this with respect to any other social catastrophe, but COVID is the catastrophe of the day. So we'll talk about that. I, I live and work in Seattle, Washington. Uh, I do have a global perspective. I get to work every year in Tanzania, for example. So I do have colleagues and friends who work overseas. Uh, the virus does not obey our geopolitical boundaries, even though that makes presidents so angry. It just doesn't. So, But I am an American person, so we'll talk uh, mostly about that. Where are we right now today with COVID-19? I pulled these stats uh, yesterday, so they're not quite up to date, but within the last 24 hours. As a species homo sapiens on the planet, this is the best information that we have. I do recommend to you the Johns Hopkins dashboard. New York Times also has an excellent dashboard. Uh, I happen to like the Hopkins one, but you can find it through a simple web search and get all the best information that we have. Hopkins does not go out and do the surveys. They are a scrape. They're a clearinghouse for all of the best information that we have reported by governments and health agencies to them. So as you can see, we have, you know, uh, almost a fifth of a billion cases, four million deaths that are reported. And uh, happy news in green, that's a new column. We can actually tick up the number of vaccines that have been given. You'll see that the United States looks very, very red in this view. And that's because we also have not only the worst record with respect to cases, but also the best case finding. So some of what we see is the limitation of the scientific data that we have. If you're not looking for cases, you simply won't report them. Well, that was president's strategy for quite some time, and thank goodness cooler heads prevailed. So we are doing pretty good surveillance and diagnostic testing as well, and that's where this comes from. Uh, we strongly suspect that if we had the same level of surveillance in other countries like Brazil and India, that the red would be much more intense in those countries also. World Health Organization has a similar view where they have broken down the pandemic by different regions represented here by different shades, different colors uh, on this epidemic curve. And I think what you'll appreciate is that while we in the United States, also Mexico, Canada, but mostly U.S., and our colleagues in Europe, the yellow and the green, while we were battling this for the last year, Asia, especially Southeast Asia, was flat. Are very, very low numbers. Still catastrophe, still a lot of people dying needlessly. But what you'll see here is not only that we have this two hump uh, spike of what we see, and we'll talk about whether that's due to a variant, whether that's due to political incompetence. I mean, the answer is yes, it's both. But look at that purple bar, and that's India, right? So what we're seeing in India it has just such an absolute preventable catastrophe. Think about those purple bars and about uh, all that time that they had to prepare watching the U.S., supposedly the most powerful nation in the country, flail away in spite of the best tech, the best testing, 
They just weren't ready. They didn't prepare, and unfortunately, their citizens are really suffering now. Within the United States, each county of residence of a person who has been diagnosed with COVID is represented by a circle. And the larger the circle, the greater the number of cases. What I take from this is that COVID is where the people are. If you look in that the Western US looks pretty good. Well, there's more animals than people and we don't test for COVID in cows. It probably can get to them, but it doesn't seem to kill them if it does. But this is a human disease and those are the, the circles that you see represented here. As of today, so that's the cumulative cases. If we look at today, where is the infection actually out of control? The more intense the red color, the more transmission pressure we see. And I think you'll agree that uh, southwestern Missouri is being hit hard. Parts of Texas are being hit hard. And then this band through the Rocky Mountains as well. What's interesting to me about this is that that band in the Rocky Mountains is very poorly populated. Although that's a hot spot, the absolute number of people infected is low. Missouri is different. Uh, southwestern Missouri is a very populous area, the Ozark part of the, of the country, and they are really seeing a lot of infections currently. This is as of a couple of days ago. And I don't think it'll be a surprise to all of you, but if we overlay and superimpose the map of immunization pressure, it is, of course, the exact opposite. So if we look at southwestern Missouri, nobody's got the vaccine. In some counties, it's less than 20%. And that number has stayed flat over time. It's not that they just got a shipment that was late or something. They just have not yet embraced immunization. So immunizations work. And the more we immunize people, the, the more protected that population will be as a whole. If we look at our epidemic curve here just in the United States, this is what it looks like. This is getting rid of Europe, Asia, et cetera. And starting from the day of the first case being identified until just a couple of days ago. I take great heart in this. Uh, I think if you look at our numbers down in that bottom right corner, it is almost as low as it was when we got started here. So our national case numbers overall are currently very low. And that's not only because so many people have already been infected, but of course, because many people have chosen to get immunized. So that's exciting. But there's another lesson here too, which is notice how the curve goes up and down. It's not just a one-way street, a big fat Gaussian distribution. It doesn't work like that. Because what we've learned is that the virus is always changing. We'll talk about mutations and variation. And people are always getting tired. People are getting tired of doing what they know may be right for them. It's just hard for people to do the right thing. So I do worry that as we approach the 4th of July, our nation's Independence Day, we celebrate the birth of our nation by blowing up a small part of it. The other thing we do is we take off our masks. And I really do worry that we may see an uptick again. In fact, if you look carefully at that bottom right corner, I think you'll see that it doesn't keep going down. It's not flat. It has already started to deflect upwards as well. This is of great concern to us. As of today, these are the number of cases that we have, the total number of deaths officially reported at 600,000 Americans in the ground. Our case fatality ratio is 0.6%. That means that if you are diagnosed with COVID-19, you have less than a 1% chance of dying of that infection. That's among everyone. That's young, healthy people like yourselves, where the case fatality ratio is actually less than one in 1,000. And that's elderly people with immune suppression, where the case fatality ratio is as high as 20%. This is the problem with averages, and really that sub-analysis of different populations based on their risk factors and susceptibilities is probably much more important. In the United States, we make up about 4% of the world's population, but we do own at least 15% of the deaths. In the United States today, you are most likely to die of cardiovascular disease, that's heart attacks and strokes, cancer, and then COVID-19 in that order. The numbers are huge, huge, and it's hard for people to wrap their minds around them. I have a number fatigue myself. There was an interesting article on this topic not long ago, talking about by statisticians and psychiatrists and psychologists, talking about the difficulty that humans have in envisioning large numbers. This is no surprise. If the human mind has not, um, doesn't have a frame of reference, unless you're a mathematician, and many of you on this call today are, so you think about scale, you think about order of magnitude, most Americans do not. And their, their frame of reference may be how many minutes it takes to get to work or how many people are in a church gathering. The numbers here are exponentially higher. And I think after a while, people's minds just shut off. And unless they see it, 
in front of them, the numbers don't have that impact. Well, for those of us in healthcare who are working with people at the end of life or struggling to survive, and most people really do fight hard, it's a terrible disease when you can't breathe, just drowning in your own secretions. You know, we can't even bring their family to the bedside to say goodbye. And holding that iPad to say goodbye to a loved one, the psychic trauma, the emotional toll it's taken on healthcare workers, nurses primarily, but also physicians, it's, that's hard to wrap your mind around as well. As a city here in Seattle, we're very fortunate. Um, we are the biggest infectious disease program in the country, if not the world. And part of that is because we really have such smart people who attract grants. Grants bring in more people. And so this does tend to snowball. Academics in science, I'm talking about life science, but the same is true in physical sciences. It's not democratic. If you choose a center of excellence, you will be surrounded by people who are brilliant and and things get more and more favorable for that center. But that does come at the detriment of other centers. I must say, it's, it's, we have a huge gap in our public health infrastructure nationwide. I wish that every hospital had someone like Dr. Helen Chu. I trained her, so I'm very proud of her. But Helen is someone who decided years ago that she would study the transmission of respiratory viral infections. Nobody studied the transmission of respiratory viral infections. It was a backwater. Nobody cared. There was something called flu, and it would kill maybe 30,000 Americans, and nobody gave a damn. But Helen did, because she really realized that, although our current rates are, by the way, unacceptably high, that we were under threat from a new novel agent that might spread in a similar way to other infections. So she dedicated her career to this process. To do so, she created something called the Seattle Flu Study. In Seattle flu, if you live in the city of Seattle and you got sick with a respiratory infection, you know, cold, sniffling, sore throat, cough, you could log on to an app and Amazon would drop off a test kit at your door that day, swab your nose and send it off. And Helen and her team would understand within a day or two what you had. It would be genetically profiled and they would then line up that profile with other specimens that came in. It's a very novel way to really leverage our economic engine here in Seattle. It's called Amazon. You may have heard of them. So she's leveraging that power to do um, genetic analysis and what we call molecular epidemiology, doing DNA footprinting to see who spreads what to whom. Well, so she was in a perfect position when COVID-19 hit to pivot from looking for flu to looking for COVID-19. That's why she det uh, detected the first case that was reported in the United States here in King County and Snohomish County. We now know that that's not true. Actually, COVID-19 had been on the East Coast in New York City uh, for quite some time, but no one was looking for it. So, you know, opportunity favors the prepared and the bold, and she did both of those things. When she tested for COVID-19, she did not have permission to do so. The Food and Drug Administration, our internal, what's called the internal review board that does uh, permissions to do research on human subjects, they had not approved her to do this. But she did talk with public health and said, look, there's this thing happening in China. It might be here. I have all these snot sickles sitting in the fridge. I really want to test for it. And they said, we can't approve this, but we think it's a smart idea. And she did. And that has made her career and, and literally hundreds of millions of dollars in grant funding because of that bold step. And it's because of her that we can have what's now not called Seattle Flu, but SCAN, the Seattle Coronavirus Assessment Network. So we have the highest quality data because we're looking for the infection. If you don't look the ostrich in the proverbial sand in the ground, you won't see things. You do have to take science and look for things, but you also have to be able to pivot, not just looking for DNA and viruses, but looking for the impact on human lives. This is the dimension to internal medicine and infectious diseases that really calls to me and fulfills me as well. Not only are people getting infected with COVID-19, but there are differences in the impact of that virus, depending on the color of someone's skin, their socioeconomic status. And this has been looked at very carefully. JAMA is one of our leading medical journals where they've looked at the proportion, just the rate of hospitalization. That's not just a small infection. To go to the hospital, I hope you guys know this, you need to be sick. Hospitals are full, they're expensive, we don't have a lot of capacity. So to actually get admitted to the hospital, you need to be ill. So that's the yardstick that this particular team took. So it's not just that people who self-identify Latinx, Native, or Black are getting more infection. They're getting more infection and they're getting worse infections. This is not a genetic reason for this. They are not immunologically inferior, they just get worse care. They're not seeing physicians, they let the infection go longer and that's why they end up having worse outcomes as well.
That's true nationally, and that's been true tracked here within our city as well. We are one of the counties called King County, where I live, named after Martin Luther King. And we're one of the counties that actually asks for information, not only about someone's medical care, but also their ethnicity and race. And that way we can line these things up from a public health perspective and understand you know, where are their outreach opportunities to reach for different, well, to elevate the level of care to people regardless of their skin color, et cetera. This has been talked about a lot through the lens of people who self-identify as black or Afro-Am, but it's not just that. It's also about economic uh, issues. This is one of many, many such stories. You may recall that there were concerns for the outbreak in food processing plants early on in the in epidemic. The president decreed that there would be no shortage of meat in the United States, and he ordered, ordered these food processing plants to stay open on pain of criminal federal prosecution or some such hokum. But he also didn't give them the tools to be safe. And so needless to say, time and again, people would come to work in a plant that was built for profit and throughput efficiency, never really built for safety, certainly not respiratory safety. So COVID-19 has roared through these plants. This is one particular example. There are many others. To be clear, the people who work in these plants did not perceive themselves to have the option of staying home. Number one, they were told they would be fired. Number two, even on a good day, you know, if they don't work, they don't eat. So this is about survival and the fact that our society had not built any kind of safety net, either a literal safety plan like masks or a virtual safety plan like stay home till this blows over, you'll still get a paycheck. That didn't exist early on. And in most parts of our society still does not. People have gotten sick, suffered, and died. I want you to know that I'm old and gray. I'm 53 years old. But I do this work because I get to work with young people more or less your age, a little older than you. These are attendings of medicine. They're fully trained in medicine, but now they're specializing in infectious disease. So two of our uh, chief uh, fellows are here. That's Olivia and Abby. Early on in the pandemic, they realized that this was, to coin a phrase, total fucking bullshit. And they really wanted people to be able to say, let's stand up for what's right, not only through the lens of COVID, but also through matter. Remember, these things are happening. The strategies that the forces of darkness pulled together was you shouldn't demonstrate on behalf of black lives because it's dangerous for COVID. You guys said COVID is dangerous. You're the ones who are telling us to wear a mask. Don't go out and demonstrate. Well, if you follow the science, you know, viral particles don't care about your political affiliation. They simply are. And it was very clear that if people were masked up and outdoors, that they could gather in great numbers very safely. This is happening back in May and June of last year, a year ago. Um, and so they put together, they were part of a team that put together a demonstration called White Coats for Black Lives. They wrote a letter uh, anonymously. You won't see their names on it, but I'm telling you, these are the two people who wrote this letter. It was signed by thousands of physicians nationwide. And what it said was, you can demonstrate safely. Here's how to do it. Now, the hate mail and death threats that we've all gotten as signatories to that letter, I was not prepared for that. People felt very threatened on the other political end of the spectrum. But their science was true, and they were exactly correct. And my university embraced this. They said, if you're going to go to this demonstration, here's how to do it safely. This came out to all healthcare workers and members of the university community. And we did, uh, MDs for BLM, and this happened extremely safely. They were exactly right. Protests do not appear to be driving coronavirus surge. In King County, the epicenter of Washington's protests, health investigators have tracked during a 19-day span in June of 2020. Less than 5% of 1,000 cases were, were people who had attended the protests, and there was no clear evidence that the protest is what had driven it. Why? Because we were masked up, we gave each other space, and we were outside. That is as safe today uh, as it was back then a huge sea change and a way for these young people to stand up and say we are scientists and we have a conscience and we're going to put those things together. We have a long way to go. What you see here is an article from a couple days ago in New York Times looking at immunization rates based on um, socioeconomic vulnerability. The top row, each circle is a county, population of a county. The colors are just different regions of the United States. That's less interesting. But the top are the most socioeconomically vulnerable, the bottom the least vulnerable. Yes, CDC has a vulnerability index. It's complicated math. It involves socioeconomic status, income, how far you are from a supermarket, how many physicians per, per people who live there. It's a measurement of vulnerability. And what you can see is that 
on average, in general, people who are more vulnerable to COVID-19's effects are the ones who are less likely to be immunized. This is, of course, inexcusable, but if we don't do the science, we wouldn't be able to identify this. The cultural impact of COVID-19 has been huge. If we think about just through the lens of African-American culture, physicians, uh, excuse me, musicians and uh, actors who have been lost, the jazz community has lost a number of legends uh, over the last few years, so has the rap community as well. These are cultural icons and people who we cannot replace, right? So we have their recordings, we know what they have done, but they will never again contribute to, to our society. It's a huge shame. Many of our superstar athletes in the U.S. are African American or self-identify as black. Not all of them are immunized. And this is, again, an opportunity for some of these people to, to have those discussions, to embrace this, to look back at what they've lost from their own communities and say, hey, I don't want to be a part of that process. Let's be safe and get our shot. Many athletes, again, Afro, AM, and otherwise, have been immunized, but not all. And I think we still have an opportunity to carry that discussion forward. For me, thinking back over our success, uh, and you may realize that here in King County, our case fatality rate and our absolute numbers are very low compared to the rest of the United States. Why is that? It's not just the university. It's also the people of Seattle. On the day that the governor said, stay home, um, back in March of 2020, I went to work that day. This is my view crossing the street. I parked by the stadium. I turned around and realized there was nobody there. Usually in that view of the stadium, I'd see 100 people coming and going to work. The view on the right is our hallway in the hospital. It's typically jammed with people. Nobody was there. Everybody was staying home. And it was this moment where my anxiety could reduce, where I realized that we were going to be okay because the, the general population got it. They were listening to the governor, and the governor in turn was listening to scientists about what to do. And this is not the photograph you would get in so many other parts of our country. And unfortunately, that has led to, well, more than 600,000 dead Americans. Healthcare workers are part of this process. You've read a lot about doctors and nurses who have been through hell with this process. That's true. Uh, it has not been equal. Unfortunately, in New York City and New York State, things went very poorly early on. And in fact, there's now a political scandal around this regarding the governor, which I don't have the details on, around hiding people, keeping them to die in nursing homes instead of in hospitals. We were not ready as a nation to do this work as doctors. And some parts of the country were really not ready. New York is one of those. These are residents who are <laughs> residents who are leaving the hospital to stand in front of their hospital with signs saying, please give us, please give us personal protective equipment. Our lives aren't worthless. Help us protect our patients. When COVID-19 was at its peak in New York City, Oriana Ramirez worked 12 hour days, six days in a row for eight weeks straight. I'd wake up at 4 a.m., be at the hospital by six, home by 10, cry in the shower, sleep and repeat. She was a third year resident in internal medicine. She did not mind the long hours, so much as the fact that patients weren't always getting the treatment they deserved. The hospital was short on funds and short on supplies. When the residents tried to bring specific problems to the attention of the administrators, they felt their concerns were unheard. When one of the residents lost her mask, she worked for two days with no mask. By May of 2020, 70% of emergency medicine residents had tested positive for COVID-19. This is completely unacceptable would never happen where I practice here in Seattle. This would never be the way. But the fact that this did happen, these are true stories, is outrageous. And that's the doctor side. Really, when we talk about the burden of healthcare worker transmission, it should be on nurses. 73% of U.S. healthcare workers are women. Women do the work of the world. That's true for these really hard jobs. Being a doctor is hard. We can talk about it. But being a nurse is really hard. You are hands-on, you're cleaning people up, you're giving the medicines, you're doing the testing. And, um, well, you can see what some sassy infectious disease doctor here. Other healthcare workers are at risk as well, but a COVID test is almost always administered by a nurse. That's just one example of the kind of exposures that we're talking about in nursing. At UW, we created, before vaccines, we created a whole uh, package of protection. This is a way for us to have people come to work uh, and be safe. And we had an unspoken agreement. The agreement said that if you do the things that are on this slide, if 
you do all of these things. And by the way, the most important thing you can do is don't come to work if you're sick, which is a huge paradigm shift. Physicians are terrible about this. We've always come to work sick, just like you guys have always gone to school sick. It's just the American way. No more. That was against policy, but it was never enforced. Now it was enforced. And the unspoken agreement was that if you do these things, when you come to work, you will be safe. And if you do that, then when you go home, you can sleep and therefore come back the next day. That there should never be a shadow of a doubt <clears throat> where a healthcare worker would say, I wonder if I got sick at work today. Could I be incubating the virus? May I be bringing it home to my child, to my ill parent who lives with me? That's not sustainable. You'll end up like poor Dr. Ramirez and you won't be able to do it. So we said, we will do this. And our numbers have been extremely favorable, even before immunization. We've had a couple hundred healthcare workers get COVID-19 virtually always out of the hospital, virtually always at a restaurant or when they've broken with protocol in civilian life, but almost never, almost never on duty within the hospital. So this was our mantra, keep calm, trust infection control. And the addition of immunization has been a huge game changer. Uh, we do have a handful of people who have gotten COVID after being immunized, none of them at work, always on a Mexican uh, vacation, going to Vegas. What happens in Vegas does not stay in Vegas, unfortunately. And for this reason, because we believe so strongly in the effectiveness and safety, this is a requirement of everyone who works in our university, not only in the healthcare side, but on upper campus, physics, all the different departments, faculty and students as well. In order for us to open up again in the fall, everyone will be immunized. And that's wonderful. There's about 40,000 of us who work at UW. Many other universities, private and state, are embracing a similar approach. We are so fortunate to have the world's best diagnostics here, so testing is key. If you don't know who's infected, you just, you're fighting with both arms restrained behind your back. So our leaders are Drs. Keith Jerome and Alex Greninger. They're both MDs, but also PhDs, and they've developed the best diagnostics we have. This is the proverbial PCR testing that you've heard so much about. Many of you have had PCR testing. It's because of the technology that they have built, they and other colleagues uh, nationwide, that we have this. The difference is that early on, CDC decided back in March and April of 2020 that they would develop diagnostic test kits. They couldn't do it. They literally were not equipped to do so, and they got contamination from their test side with their, with their supply side, with their testing side. It was a mess. These guys did not wait for that. They built their own test up to the cleanest standard. So we've actually had early diagnostics uh, for a long time with a very excellent negative predictive value. That means if it's a negative test, you can rely on it more than 95% of the time. The positive predictive value is also superb. It doesn't just come out of the air. If you see a positive test, that's the coronavirus. And a turnaround time that's fast. Turnaround time is key. If you need to send something like we used to to CDC and wait a week later, by then the patient's either cured or dead and they've already gone on a cruise. So you have to have rapid, reliable diagnostics. That's thanks to uh, molecular science, and we're very fortunate to have the best here. Testing equals safety. We've done testing. I won't go through the details here with you, but anybody in our system who works at UW, number one, testifies on a web app that they are safe to go, that they have no exposures, that they feel well. And if they do have symptoms, they push a different button and they rapidly go up and get tested same day for free. And this has helped us to figure out exactly who does and does not have the infection. Everybody who's coming to our hospital is tested as well. <clears throat> we've done this among asymptomatic people. And on a few occasions, we found folks who said they feel good, they look good. They're usually coming in from a different part of the state or a different part of the country. And sometimes they actually have asymptomatic shedding of coronavirus. This helps us to keep our people safe in the hospital as well. All of our protocols are online. Seattle was first with the pandemic in the US. So we were first to get 10,000 emails from everybody else. What do you do? How do you take care of this? Our attorneys usually keep, uh, keep things under wraps. They don't like to share internal safety protocols. This was different. We made a decision as a team early on that this would all be shared with the world. So all of our protocols are free, open source. Anytime we change something, we just put it up there with a disclaimer that says, if you do this and somebody dies, it's not on us. And we've never been sued for that reason. In general, when there's scientific information, it needs to be shared in daylight, open source. That's how, that's how things move forward scientifically. Just to pause for a moment, how did we get um, where we are? This is the virus. 
Remember, we call it the Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2, and the sickness that it gives you is called Coronavirus Infectious Disease of 2019, COVID-19. This is what it looks like. It's a virus. It's not a bacteria. It's a virus. And so these viruses are very simple. As you recall, viruses, they don't even have their own energetic engines. They do depend on the host machinery for cellular reproduction and budding. So over many, many years, there have been, of course, many other viruses. Coronaviruses have been in human circulation for a long time. They cause the common cold. We've all had coronaviruses, uh, and they're usually very minor. Occasionally, someone would die of corona, but it was rare. That's the human lineage. There's also animal lineages. And these animal lineages have popped up their ugly head periodically. The first year that I was an ID fellow in 2002 and 2003, that's when SARS-CoV-1 came out, SARS. Uh, that was an issue in Guangdong, uh, in southern China, and also in Hong Kong. It's a funny coincidence. My brother was a journalist writing for Wall Street Journal, living in Hong Kong at the time. So he covered that whole story. So he and I would talk all the time about what does this mean? What's the epidemiology here? What, how is this going to go? So he built up some knowledge and contacts within the scientific community in China who were extremely brilliant. These are scientists who were very willing to talk on the record 20 years ago. You know, they were in Hong Kong. Hong Kong at that time was a free city state. It had not yet been subsumed by the Chinese Communist Party. So people were not being jailed for speaking their mind. They actually felt themselves as scientists to be um, empowered, to have their voice heard. And that worked. Um, and thank goodness that was a way for the original SARS epidemic to be very, very small in its impact. A few hundred people died, which is regrettable, but nothing like what we're seeing today. That's not the only example. This has also come back through camels. That's called MERS. There have been other similar examples. Often the link seems to be in bats. It's not clear why this happens, but the immune system of a bat is fascinating. Bats are mammals, and they <laughs> therefore are susceptible to many of the viruses that we are as other mammals, but they don't seem to get so sick. They tolerate these viruses very well, and I don't understand why. Some of the most brilliant scientists are actually in China working on this problem. What is it about a bat that allows it to be a vector, a transmission vessel for certain infections? Not yet clear, but that seems to be the case again here as well. I want to cast my mind back to 2002. These are photographs that I took at the animal market uh, in Guangzhou in 2004. My brother and I went back exactly a year later to the day after SARS-1 was, um, was described. It was felt at that time that it had been transmitted to humans from a civet, which is a funny cat-like creature. We, I wanted to see the animal market because the, um, the government and public health agencies said that they were going to clean things up in this animal market. I said, well, have they made change? Let's see what happens. So we took a train from Hong Kong to uh, Guangzhou and went to the market, and um, it was a very emotional experience. The animals were treated very, very badly. I'm not a PETA person, by the way, but it was hard. Uh, this is a semi-trailer full of goats or sheep or something, and you want a dog, you can get a dog. They stick them in lobster cages, six to a cage, and they just sell them by the cage. So it was very, very difficult um, circumstances for these animals. And that, number one, tough conditions. Number two, huge diversity of animals. And I just kept a list of all the different things that I saw for sale. Fish and uh, birds and reptiles, a lot of mammals, all being kept together in very, very unsanitary conditions. There were a few civets there, although they were not meant to be. And finally, you know, the people doing this work, these are people coming from different provinces within China. This is their livelihood. They'll raise animals or they'll get them from the forest, bring them in to be sold. Because uh, in this part of the country, it's part of their culinary tradition. And so it's a long way to go. China's a big country. So they'll come in with their, with their stock and, sell, and they'll, you know, sell them in these large airplane hangars. The stalls are where the, the food is available. The animals, usually sold live or butchered right on the spot without sufficient um, sanitary conditions. These people are butchering animals. They don't have the option to wash their hands or get rid of fecal material. The, the market's not built for that. And it's also a long way to go. So they will stay there. What you see above are the, the stalls where families will live, usually in very cramped conditions. So um, adorable little kids. 
I, I, I cannot conceive of a more perfect way for viruses to be transmitted than the way this particular market was set up. It's not typical of all that's in China, and it's not the fault of the people doing the work, but it is the way that this particular market was set, set for profit, not set for the safety of the people who live and work there. Back in Hong Kong, remember, Hong Kong is not part of Guangdong. It was an independent city-state. Very different, very strong tradition of uh, public health. And they were worried about SARS. So a year later, there were all sorts of signs all over the city, do not spit. You would not see such a sign here in the U.S., but they were, took it very seriously. Not only had they been through SARS, they'd also been through HPAI. That's highly pathogenic avian influenza, bird flu. They took it very seriously, and most ordinary folks on the street would be masked. Now, it's not only for infectious disease concern, it's also because they had terrible air quality without good regulation of exhaust from mopeds and stuff like that. But this made a difference, and the numbers of infections from SARS in Hong Kong was very, very low, in spite of the fact that there was some SARS there at that time. People would adapt, life would go on, and you could still send your kids to school, et cetera. They would just be masked. It was part of their culture. It was very advanced thinking. So when I saw this outbreak in late December of 19, I thought, well, this is going to be another SARS. Like, I, I just, I don't give a damn. It's going to be a flash in the pan. It'll be very deadly. We'll have a few people die. But remember, deadly infections are not a threat to a population because they kill their host. <laughs> That's not what you're looking for. Ebola virus disease, you may have heard of, which is a phylovirus, another RNA virus that is in parts of Central and West Africa. Very deadly. Half of its patients may die. There will never be a Ebola virus pandemic. You can't because everybody is getting killed. It doesn't spread like that. So I thought that would be the same thing here, and I was completely wrong. I was cast my mind back to 2003 when the U.S. media was so worried about SARS. You guys don't remember this. You're too young. Everybody was worried about SARS, and no one was really talking about what, to me, was a bigger issue, which was HIV infection, etc. I was completely wrong. This has turned out to be a huge deal. And we know that now because of the excellence of the scientific work and the doctors in, uh, in Wuhan. I've been to Wuhan. It's a really cool city. They have great medical science there, great hospitals. And the doctors were really doing the best that they could with very flawed, limited data. They did not have a test for this infection. But they did have good clinical acumen. So they could see who was sick with a flu-like illness and then track those people. That's the epidemic curve you see in the gray bars. Testing did not become available until later. That's the confirmatory test that you see in the yellow bars. So testing confirmation always comes after the clinical experience. What public health leaders did here was very savvy. They realized that they had something, it was probably going to be a SARS, and that it was likely to spread somehow through respiratory secretions. And so they built immediately, in a way we could never do in the US, they built huge hospitals, quarantine areas. If you were sick or symptomatic, you did not stay home. You went to a stadium or a big building and you stayed in your own private chamber. This is basically like a tennis court with a bunch of curtained off areas. So they quarantined together everybody who was sick. This is completely different from the US where we would never impose our will on people. We say just stay home, stay home. The Chinese did have this tradition and it actually worked and the epidemic curve in Wuhan turned out to be, it was terrible. I mean they had a lot of people die. Awful. But holy cow, their epidemic curve came right down because they had total control. I'm not a fan of the totalitarian regime of the political apparatus that's over there, but sometimes for public health, actually, there can be benefits. That made a difference. What I'm not a fan of is the fact that they continued to allow jumbo jets to leave every single day from Wuhan to Europe to the United States. I mean, that's how this really seeded itself into a global catastrophe. The glossary of terms, you'll hear a lot about droplets. Yes, it's true, and you know this as physics-minded people. Droplets are spheres. Spheres come in different sizes. And so if you think about what happens in a rainstorm versus what happens in the defogger or the humidifier you have in your room, there's a huge range of sizes of these droplets. So early on, what we said was that, and I was part of this too, this is what I'd been told in medical school, that people make droplets and doctors make aerosols. That aerosols are not usually a thing, except in a few viruses like measles. Measles will spread like wildfire, but for most of these respiratory infections, it's the big stuff that you can see, it usually falls to the ground within about six feet, thus the proverbial safe six. Keep yourself six feet away from others and that the small stuff won't get you. This is wrong. Uh, we now know, unfortunately, that there are small microscopic droplets. By definition, we call it an aerosol if it's so light that it will float on air currents 
before the effect of gravity will pull it to the ground. And those little droplets are a big threat as well. Now, both of these droplet sizes are dramatically, dramatically reduced for people who properly cover their nose and mouth with something that's multi-layered mask. But if we don't do that, then six feet alone by itself will not be enough, certainly not enough in the indoor context. I think a lot about the year 1968. This is the year I was born, so that's one of the reasons I think about it. But I also think about it, this is one of the reasons that I chose to study, as you said, history and literature when I was in college, because there are certain seminal times in our history that are pivotal, where a lot of things happen that have reverberations that last for generations to come. The American Civil War is one, obviously, and so was 1968, often called the year that shattered America. We lost Dr. King, we lost RFK. We had people who stood up for black lives. They didn't call it that at that time. But that's exactly what was happening in the Voting Rights Act and a big rebellion against the war in Vietnam. So this supposedly was the year that shattered our country and split us into two, two different societies. And I would suggest to you that that is what has happened, not only with COVID-19, but also with the previous administration. To be clear, it's not Trump's fault alone. I think he is more symptomatic of than causative, but he certainly didn't make things better. You know, when I look, we've never been so divided in my lifetime. I'm 53 years old. When I look at this map, this is the map of the Electoral College from the first election, 2016. Um, you know, it's said that we're a country of red and blue. To me, there's a lot of purple. I think there's a lot of overlap, and I think there's a lot of room for common ground as well. And that is why, you know, when you zoom in and look scientifically, who votes for what party? It is very urban-rural split. Even within a county that can be a sort of shade of lavender, the closer you are to a city center, the more blue, the farther you get away, the more red it is. This is a problem. We have to fix this. There are exceptions, which is good, but there need to be a lot more exceptions. Because until we can find that common ground, we end up in real trouble. Now, Trump made this so much worse by inciting rebellion, telling people to liberate Minnesota, always in capitals. I don't know why he does that give me liberty or give me death. Here's somebody who does not want to wear their mask, so they're holding up a sign in front of a Baskin Robbins ice cream shop. I, I don't know why. Social distancing is communism. I, I can't figure that out. I think they've lost the idea that your liberty is the death of somebody else. Wear a mask to protect yourself and others. I don't know why that social contract is so confusing. Where else have we seen this idea of equating communism with things? Oh yeah, race mixing is communism. The photograph you see on the right uh, was taken circa 1963. Please understand that the people holding those signs, many of them are still alive. This is a black and white picture. This is to not have a context view. Many of these folks are still voting. Many of them are still here in the United States. Some of them may have changed their mind. I would hope to think that some of these people would realize that races can be mixed. But my point is that these reverberations from the old days are still here with us. I think that's why their children and grandchildren are holding up the same flipping signs all these decades later. When I think about people who are doing all that pioneering work under Dr. King and others for voting rights, you know, it's a very similar story. What we see the advances we had in Georgia uh, and other states, which has just been such a huge step forward that people are actually have a voice at the polling booth in spite of their color of their skin. That didn't just happen in Georgia. That is the result of many decades of hard work uh, and suffering, frankly. There's a direct line that goes from COVID-19 to the insurrection that happened at the Capitol. It's not the only reason that they did this, but I think it's a huge part of it. Dare I say, if we had not had COVID-19, and if the president hadn't completely bungled the response, I think the outcome of the election would have been different, put it that way. Now, I, I remember very well, we talked about Ebola. Let's talk about Ebola again. Ebola virus disease is not spread so much by respiratory droplets, but by direct human contact with blood with body secretions, urine, feces. You have to touch someone to spread it in most cases. And it's a very hardy virus in the environment. It's hard to get rid of. And I remember this episode in 2014 so well. What you see before you is a diagram <clears throat> made by our colleagues at CDC. It's a beautiful textbook piece of work. The shaded oval at the left is a person who died of Ebola virus, and we don't know how they caught it. But everyone else, every other circle is uh, someone else who got Ebola virus, and we can trace their contact to that person. How did this happen? Because in this tradition in Liberia, the tradition for funerary rites is that when someone dies, the family comes together, they prepare the body, they wash it, it is dressed in a 
respectful way. It's interred in the ground by the family. That's their culture. And that's exactly how the Ebola virus spread like wildfire, including to some people who died of this infection. And I remember very well in 2014, a lot of Americans, some of whom were my colleagues, who would say, well, why don't they just stop doing that? For the love of God, don't touch the dead body. Just have somebody else take care of it and the problem will go away. Which is true, but I would suggest and request that the next time someone says something like that, please respectfully tell them to shut the hell up. It's the same thing in the United States. We knew going into spring break of 2020 that there was COVID everywhere, that if people gathered like this unmasked, drinking, hooting and hollering, screwing, whatever people are doing on spring break, that there would be wildfire spread of COVID-19. That's exactly what happened. People's cultural expectations are hard to change. These poor kids didn't want to miss their beer bong, whatever they're doing. They didn't want to change, even though they were told that they should. So this is a human condition. This is one of the most stunning photographs of the entire pandemic, which just knocks my socks off. Every pixel, you may have seen this, right? Every golden pixel is a ping from a cell phone. They all started down in uh, Palm Beach. I think it's Miami, Florida. If you look down the bottom right, that really light spot. The phone companies, then they knew who was there, and then they followed them over the next two weeks to see where they went. Now, it's all de-identified, so this isn't exactly Eric Snowden stuff, but they know that every cell phone <laughs> that started in, in that part of the country, well, you can see where they went over the course of the next two weeks. So the point is that what happens in Miami doesn't stay in Miami. People spread around. You know, when I saw this picture, I was feeling pretty spiffy. Look at the West, man. We were looking dark. I was thinking, we are, we are good. We're not going down to all these shenanigans in Miami. That was completely wrong. Actually, this photograph was from two days before the first one I showed you. This is the city of Seattle. We have a soccer team. They call it football, but it's confusing to me. But anyway, soccer is called Seattle Sounders. They're very good, apparently. Some of the best in the country. And the Sounders were going to have this playoff or something. And so people decided to have a parade to celebrate the Seattle Sounders. Really bad idea. These people are close and they're not, they're outside, which is good, but they're not masked. This was early on in the pandemic. Dr. Jeff Duchin is our head of um, communicable diseases here at um, Seattle King County. And he just talked about how, you know, he knew this was wrong, but he did not have the agency as a medical scientist to speak to the business community and say, you cannot do this. There are gonna be 10,000 people in that stadium and you, you can't make this happen. Sure enough, it did happen. And sure enough, there's been a lot of cases associated with that particular activity. It's one of the last public gatherings in our city of Seattle until this coming next coming week. To know the right thing, to have people's best interests at heart and to not have the power to make that happen. Well, very different from China, where they can just by fiat do what they want to do. In the US, we don't have that cultural story. So I always say, keep calm and trust public health, Seattle King County. I wish more people would do that. And that's why all those months later, when people went to Sturgis, which apparently is a really fun motorcycle rally, it sounds like a crazy time. I have friends who've been doctors there in years past. This is such a mistake to have, you know, half a million people come together unmasked drinking, many of whom are veterans of the war in Vietnam. They're older, they're actually high risk for, for infection. And nobody tracked them. We only know of uh, one person who died, at least in the original, epidemic, but it's thought that maybe a quarter million cases were part of this. If you think back to the curve that I showed you, the epidemic curve in the U.S., think about the timing of this in September and then that big spike that came right after July. I think this was a big kindling that sparked the fire at that time. This has been called by a number of things. Toxic individualism is what us medical scientists call it. I kind of like that term. The idea is that somebody can make their own decision for themselves, but it's toxic because it literally harms other people. I don't know what to call it exactly. But a lot of bitterness among older Americans uh, for people in your age bracket, um, where there's huge amounts of cases, although very few deaths that are there. Most young people who get COVID-19 will be fine. We do lose a few young people. I've seen college students die here in our hospital. It's awful, awful, awful. But most college students won't die this way. And so there's been a lot of folks who are older who are upset with people of your generation. I think it's incorrect. I mean, I remember being a high school student, a college student. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to 
I had worked really hard in high school. I had earned my way into a good college. And I really wanted to have that experience. I can't imagine if I was told to stay home, do it th from my bedroom, how I would have responded. Not nearly as gracefully as you guys have. I'm sure that that's actually true. And by the way, the people who got us into trouble with the pandemic, that's the old folks who voted for Trump. So I think they should shut the hell up and realize that actually people in your generation are leading and doing very well. So you'll see sassy memes like this about um, people who don't care about themselves. I don't think that that's necessarily a generational thing. And if there are generational splits, I think there's a lot to answer for in the older population. Not everybody, but these are these people are not scientists. Let's put it that way. Let's put it that way. Um, so why do we in medical science hate the former president so much? Because he lied about us and said we were killing patients, that we were getting rich off of people's dead bodies. Other hokum, I think this is what he would do, just throw stuff at a wall, see what would stick. But we take it personally because we're the ones who are actually doing the work and in some cases getting sick ourselves in so doing. Are there new treatments for COVID-19? Guys, I'll just be very clear about this. Not so much. The best thing we can do if you get the disease is to support you and allow the body to heal. Uh, there are some treatments that we can offer, and they do provide, in some cases, a reduction in your symptomatic time, but not a lot. Most of what we go through with these patients is supportive care, and whatever the politicians have come up with, take your, take your Plaquenil, take your z pack take your Ivermectin, it's all bullshit. There's just nothing there. And we have had to test this in multi-million dollar, incredibly painstaking, time-sucking studies to prove that it's all wrong. But the proof is there. Right? The, the scientific papers don't care who reads them. They don't care if people like what they see. The science rules. The science trumps what we see otherwise. And that's what we've had to do in each of these cases. Treatment will not stop the pandemic. We've been through this before. This is a newspaper from Seattle Times, 1918. We've been through a very similar process with the so-called Spanish flu. It was not a Spanish flu. It came from Kansas when birds from Southeast Asia came to Kansas to overwinter and uh, gave it to the doughboys, American service people who then went to Europe and, and took it with them. So we should call it Kansas bird flu, although nobody does. The way out of this, of course, is through immunization. Vaccines are the way out. We have approximately 30 vaccines in global development. Three of them are here in the United States. They're not perfect, but they are very close to perfect. They're not totally safe, but they're very close to being totally safe. The challenge is how to get people to do it. This is Dr. Dan Reddy. She runs our process here at UW. Thanks to her and her colleagues, we have immunized, well, we've given hundreds of thousands of doses just through our hospital system alone. This is why Seattle King County, you may have seen in the news, first, first county in America where we achieved more than 70% of people age 12 and older to be immunized. And that's why our case rates currently are so very, very low. This is the virus, and as you recall, it has those spikes. That's where the name corona comes from. Those spikes are bind to our epithelial lining. That's called um, the angiotensin converting uh, enzyme 2 or ACE2 receptor. So what we're doing with the, the spikes are key. And if you can get rid of spike, you can get rid of this virus. And so that's how these mRNA vaccines work. Those small bits of the RNA that encode for spike are put into a very proprietary special spherule, a micro spherule. And that micro spherule buds uh, merges with the uh, antigen presenting cells of the dendritic cells of your immune system. And those cells start making spike. It's harmless because, of course, there's no virus there. It doesn't have a capsid. It's just the spike. But it makes hella spike and a lot of it and presents it very efficiently. That's true for our mRNA vaccines. We also have a DNA vaccine here in the US made by Johnson & Johnson. Instead of starting with RNA, it starts with DNA. Instead of a microspherial, it uses a chimpanzee adenovirus as its uh, delivery package. Same idea, making spike, presenting spike, building antibodies, which in most people, especially of your age, healthy young people, you look like to me, you know, you're gonna make huge titers of anti-spike IgM and IgG, which really lends very significant protection that is probably durable for many months to come. We don't know yet, it's still new. Uh, we suspect that most of us will need a booster in the fall, but to be continued. You'll uh, get all sorts of questions, how well do these vaccines work? Remember, the efficacy of a vaccine is how wor well it works in a trial. The effectiveness is how well it works in, in real life. And this gets confused in lay press. So if you hear somebody say the vaccine is 95% efficacious. I don't like that. I want to know what was your outcome? Were you looking for symptomatic disease, test positivity, death? 
right? So here's the example from uh, the Pfizer trial. The eight out of 18,198 patients in the vaccine arm got symptoms, symptoms, not dead, not hospitalized, they just got sick, versus 162 out of a virtually identical number that were randomized into the control arm, the placebo. Therefore, eight out of 162, there's your 5%. The people in the study had roughly a 1% chance of getting COVID-19, if you think about it, right? So that prevalence, the transmission pressure in the population, that really impacts the level of protection that you get. If you got vaccinated, I think you'll agree with me on the arithmetic that you had about a five in 10,000 risk of getting COVID over the course of the study. None of them got hospitalized, none of them died. But that background risk really matters. What if the background risk was 10% because nobody's masking, everybody's drinking, there's a problem. Then the numbers come out to be different, uh, right? So you have now a 0.5% chance instead of uh, a lower chance. 5% chance of ineffectiveness, if you will. So this, these are the kinds of numbers. The reason I raise this with you is that you may have some challenging and fun, interesting conversations with family members, friends. If you have people who are curious about effectiveness of vaccines, this is the kind of arithmetic that it takes to really have these conversations. We've gone through the process in Washington State of rolling out our vaccines. We believe in them. Currently, as is true everywhere else in the U.S., everyone who is over the age of 12, oh, excuse me, over the age of 11, 12 and older, is uh, authorized and approved to get their vaccine. We've had to talk about whether immunization makes a difference in terms of what's safe and not safe to do in the community. These graphs are becoming much simpler. As we get more and more people immunized, the answer that we're hearing from CDC is, go outside, be with people, do what you wanna do. If you got your vaccine, you're good. It's a little more subtle than that, right? You may be older. You may have immune suppression for an autoimmune disease your effectiveness may be less than other people. So individual people need to make a decision, regardless of whether they're immunized, whether they will follow the standard of, I've got my shot, I'm gonna to go to a bar. That may not be safe, I'll change it. That is not safe for certain individuals based on their personal risk factors. Take that into account. And that's happening at the exact same time. We're dealing with the new mutants, which my 17-year-old son tells me is a rotten film in the multiverse or something like this. But the new mutants or variants that you've heard about, these are a very significant threat to us. Every time the virus buds, of course, it will have mistakes. This is RNA. DNA, like you and I have, that's our blueprint. And when it makes a mutation, it either dies or gives us cancer. These guys are made of RNA. And as you recall, RNA, much less fidelity, much more error prone, which is a huge advantage to the virus. Because even if 99 out of 100 changes, even if 999 out of 1,000 changes lead to failure, stillbirth of that virus, once in a while through random stochastic chance, there will be something that's advantageous to the virus. And if that thing is advantageous by definition, the natural selection would be transmissibility. In particular, the tip of the spike that has a better binding onto that lining of a person. Remember, the virus doesn't want to become more deadly. It wants to become less deadly, more contagious. My vision and hope for the future of this virus is that it will become like the other coronas that we currently deal with, a human problem, which causes a common cold and not much more. That's currently the case for most people with COVID. It's those rare people who get an overly exuberant autoimmune or immune activation. That's the deadliness. Now, the names have been confusing with these variants. Thank goodness WHO has done something right. They came up with a new uh, cladistic for this, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Here, where I uh, live, we have something called epsilon as well, which is coming from the so-called California variant. Some of you live in California, that's epsilon variant. WHO doesn't care about California, but that's what we think about as well. So when you hear about delta, 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 what's up with delta? Described in India, much more uh, communicable, more contagious, a greater threat uh, to the communities where it hits. Currently in Washington state, about 5% of our cases are Delta. We have every expectation that that number will rise to 50% or greater. Uh, the good news is that our immunizations do still provide, yes, pretty good protection against virtually all of these, uh, against all of these variants. That's key because it's at the tip of the spike, that little white bit you can see there, that binding avidity between spike and uh, epithelial lining. That's where all these mutations are happening. Other mutations are happening elsewhere throughout the virus. Nobody cares about those because it's the tip of the spike that leads to communicability. You'll hear people talk about toxicity. Are they more deadly? Do they cause, do they secrete toxins? I, I doubt it. I think this is really a numbers game. 
we know that the more virus you get as an inoculum at your time of infection, the greater your risk of having a very exuberant immune reaction, unless you're immunized. Yeah. So if you have these tough conversations with friends, family, some of my thoughts, and I'd love to hear from you about how you've been able to do this in your own experience, because I'm always learning about this. I'm a germ doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. So I, I need to learn a lot about this. But I would say if people in your life that you care about are not yet immunized or haven't yet chosen to do so, it's okay. Talk to them. Listen intently. Understand what their concerns are and do it with all humility. No one wants to be told, of course, what to do. I think you should speak your own truth if you're immunized and that has allowed you to have a healthy, productive life. You've been able to go out with friends and feel like a weight is lifted off your shoulders. Tell people about that. If you've been immunized and you've had a big immune response, fever, aches, pains, talk about that too. People should know that this is a very effective vaccine, but that for many people who receive them, at least the mRNA vaccines, they may feel like crap for a couple of days. They should be told about this. Don't hide it. Enjoy it. Enjoy the shakes and chills because it means you're having a rockin' good response. I think what speaks to Americans is the human connection. And if there's someone in your life that you care about, you should tell them that. Ideally in person, but if it has to be on Zoom, it's okay. If someone knows that you are afraid that they will die, then that may motivate them, not to take care of themselves, but because they don't want to injure and hurt you. There's an altruism that's there, if only we are willing to call upon it. And finally, of course, encourage them to take this up with their physician. You're not expected to know all the deets and tails of, well, you're not immunologist, not yet. So it's fine. Talk with your physician. What I don't like is people getting their information from Instagram, from Twitter, from Fox News. That won't work. Talk to a licensed medical doctor. That's what we do. It's actually a whole profession. It's called the profession of medicine, and we're happy to talk with people about this. And finally, please do not beat your head against a wall. You will not change everybody's mind. There's some people who've decided that, you know, it's coming from the 5G and Bill Gates has microchips in there. Just walk away. Your time is too precious. You will not change that person's mind, and um, nor should you have to. And they're going to get what they deserve, I'm sorry to say. And just brush it off. Brush it off. The problem with COVID-19 is not just death. I'm going to conclude with a few more slides and we'll have plenty of time for conversation. COVID-19 has very rare but lasting side effects in some people. This is probably true for other viral infections as well. So that if one in 10,000 people develops psychiatry-related issues such as schizophrenia, psychosis, you know, for influenza, that probably happens also. We just don't see it because we don't have as much flu. Well, now with so much COVID, we are seeing all kinds of creepy, unpredictable, strange ass, awful reverberations because there's just so much. People literally going insane. They're not making it up. And it's not a coincidence. It is related to the immune activation within the brain. The virus gets into the brain. That's usually okay. But once in a while, it is not okay. And uh, as some of you may know, we have very limited treatments for for schizophrenia and acute psychosis. Some good treatments, but it is something that uh, is a real burden on those people and their family. That's one rare example, but remember, one in 10 people who are interviewed three weeks after they're sick will say, I am not right. I am not right. I can't run anymore. I had to drop out of the track team. I can't work. I had to drop my calculus class. People's brains, their physiology is not the same. One of the biggest burdens, which is weird but true, is that people can't taste food anymore. Most of taste is actually smell. I suppose you guys probably know that. There's only four real tastes, salt, sweet, bitter, sour, and umami. I guess the fifth taste. But everything else is smell. And because the virus comes in through the cribriform plate, our olfactory nerve is severely injured in some cases. That sounds like a small thing, that you can't taste food, but, but just think about that. Never being able to taste a vanilla ice cream again, or a steak, or whatever it is that you like. Um, it's a problem. We don't know exactly why this happens. There have been different hypotheses as to what's driving this post-acute COVID syndrome, but I think it's the immune system. The immune system is pissed off. It was revved up to fight the infection. That's good. You're alive. But now we need to tamp it down. The immune system is too damn high, and getting that system to come down has been extremely challenging. The immune system is hyper-complex. It is not simple, and we lack nuanced uh, surgical tools to go in and reduce it in a way that is sensible, safe, and evidence-based. 
If you'd like more information about COVID-19, please subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, this is free. It's open source. You can web search for this. I would encourage you and your families to do this as well, whether they are scientifically inclined or not. It's called the Alliance for Pandemic Preparedness at UW, and if you web search for that, you'll find it. You can subscribe to this newsletter. How do you keep up with the firestorm of papers coming out? Well, these are talented physicians who are doing that for you. Every day they read several hundred papers and they pick out the handful that are the most relevant, high quality, trustworthy, based on what they can see. And they send it to you in an email newsletter. I do recommend it to you. When I think about where we are today as a physician and the opportunity that we have, I think about my predecessors all of whom are photographed here, you wouldn't know them, but they're famous people who dealt in the 1980s and 1990s with the HIV, what we now call the HIV epidemic. Uh, they did so at a time when HIV was undescribed, it was a novel pathogen, it wasn't clear how it was transmitted, we didn't know how to treat it. But these doctors went to work every day and they touched those patients, laid hands on them and did their level best to keep them alive. And in many cases, they did help to get them to survive. For me, as a medical educator, that's the current, these are our current crop of ID fellows. They're going through the same process now. This is a challenge that is really unprecedented in our lifetimes, much tougher than HIV, I would suggest, in some ways, in other ways, easier, different. But that's the motivation that's driving more people to go into life of epidemiology medical science, life science, infectious disease, and medicine. And for these people, the ones you see here before you, they're the ones who are going to bear the torch long after I'm dead and gone. These are the people who are going to drive it forward and help take care of our whole society. That's the way I feel about all of our healthcare workers at the hospital here standing for their portraits. It's the way I feel about the people in our own team. I'll conclude with this image, which is, uh, I think you would probably recognize it. This is a Rorschach test. Dr. Rorschach was a psychiatrist. He wanted people to talk about themselves, but he didn't want to lead the witness. So he just wanted people to start talking. What's really on their subconscious? How do we evoke that? So he was very brilliant. He just took a piece of, dribbled some ink on a piece of paper, folded it in half and unfolded it. It's called an ink blot. And then he would show it to people and see, see what they said. And he could study this. Some people see a butterfly. Some people see an ugly clown face. By studying this over time, he could realize that this is a way to evoke what people are really thinking about and their true priorities in, inside. And that's COVID. COVID is our Rorschach. Every time we doom scroll, every time we log on to Zoom, every time we go to a supermarket, every time we see our grandparents, whatever, COVID is there. It is not a political affiliation. It doesn't have a Twitter account. It doesn't even have little thumbs to tweet with if it did. It's there. And although it's not a 5G thing, it might as well be. My humble suggestion to you is that COVID-19 is not an infectious disease. It is a human behavioral disorder. It's a very real virus and we kill it with vaccines and you wear a mask and it goes away. The problem is not the virus. The problem is us and how we have decided to value science within our society, how we have decided where public health falls on our level of priorities, where education is. This is syndromic and symptomatic of decades of neglect. Uh, within the scientific growth of our society. And uh, I think it's up to your generation. I am so sorry, I'm trying. <laughs> but it is going to be up to your generation to bring it forward, to elevate science to the place where it should be, which is a leadership position and never subservient to political whims. I, I know sometimes it feels like this as a physician. It's easy, it's like riding a bike. Set the bike's on fire, you're on fire. Everything's on fire and you're in hell. It's not always like that, although sometimes it feels that way. It's a fun, exciting career. If you're considering a career in science, these are the criteria that I would suggest that you cogitate on. Are you eager to never be bored, ever? Never be bored one day in your life. If you're interested in finding the truth, you may be a budding scientist. If you wanna push boundaries of knowledge and just a fulfilling career where you will be happy with your choice for the rest of your life, you're probably a scientist. Within infectious diseases, it, it has all those features plus these, that we care about people more than money, we're not well paid, that's okay. We're endlessly fascinated by the infection, not just homo sapiens, but all the different germs that come into us. That diversity of cast of characters is what drives me. We make a difference for our patients, at least we try. We're interested in facts and science more than politics. We brook no bullshit. We're happy to stand up and speak truth to power. And again, to be fulfilled in our in our lifetime. So that's what I had to say. I'm sorry I went a little bit over the planned time. But yeah, I'm happy to take questions either from chat, off the cuff, or whatever you would prefer. 
Okay, well, thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I believe we have a team who is ready to go with some questions. Um, so team two. You guys yeah, thank you so much for an amazingly in and informative presentation, Dr. Pottinger, and about like COVID-19 in Seattle, the nation, and even the world. So we have a few questions for you that are from all of our participants. The thank first you. one is, do bats usually transmit infectious diseases to humans or does the virus typically undergo a mutation in other animals before it can affect human populations? It's a great question. There are examples of both. The bat, um, in the case of NIPA virus, N-I-P-A-H, that does seem to be bat to human. There was a movie made about this, uh, Steven Soderbergh movie with Gwyneth Paltrow. What was it called? Outbreak or something like that. That's a good movie about that situation. So bats can transmit it directly to humans. We think that's likely what has happened here uh, in the case of some people doing caving work, trying to harvest bat guano uh, down in southern parts of China. Bat guano you can burn for fuel or something. So you can catch it that way. Rabies can spread that way. You guys are all vulnerable to rabies. Uh, if you ever, please, for God's sakes, if you ever see a bat in the wild, if you ever see a bat, just don't touch it because it may be a rabid bat. Bats are not necessarily killed quickly by rabies, but boy, they can sure spread it. So that direct spread is possible. It's also perfectly possible that they could spread to pigs, civets. I just thought it might be from a pangolin or something as a mixing intermediary vessel. Depends on the virus. Some viruses are very happy to be in different um, animals and others less so. So we need to study this. And there are some very brilliant scientists in China who have been working on exactly this question. We strongly think that in fact, unfortunately, that some of them may have gone down the wrong path by doing what's called gain of function research, really trying to understand the virus and the way it makes people sick. It's important science, but it's also perilous because unless it's done under very stringent conditions, this can lead to infection of humans. That may be what happened in the case of COVID-19. Nobody knows because the political apparatus is embarrassed by this. They won't allow an honest, open accounting of this. So at the moment, we don't know if that's what happened here, but I would say um, it certainly is possible. Um, it may not be a coincidence that they're doing this research in the very city a couple blocks from where they found their first cases. We'll find out, maybe. Maybe we'll never know. I think it's pretty clear that we should say, whether it's bat to pig or otherwise, if we're going to look at this, we need to do it under very, very thoughtful, regulated, stringent conditions, obviously. Thank you. Um, so our second question is, how does the COVID-19 pandemic compare to the Kansas bird flu more than a century ago? Yeah, thank you. So Spanish flu, Kansas bird flu, I'm glad you called it that. Uh, that was worse in terms of total lives lost. Um, the case fatality ratio was higher in highly pathogenic avian flu at that time than what we're seeing now with COVID. At least we think so. As you can imagine, answering the question in terms of how many people got the flu versus died, you know, the diagnosis back then did not have PCR. We didn't have the structure for DNA at that time. So testing did not exist. It was a clinical impression. Nevertheless, uh, no, things, you know, the level of care was not as high then. Ventilators weren't as good. The supportive medical technology wasn't quite the same. So that may be why more people died of bird flu. Um, although I can't recall at the moment exactly those numbers, although you'd easily be able to find it. But those numbers were higher. And I hopefully that's good news that we've come a century maybe we can really cut back on some of those on some of those deaths what it was about that bird flu that made it more deadly compared to COVID-19 is not yet clear so we need a lot more science to understand why that was so bad and why this is also bad but why is it different can we somehow capitalize on those biological differences maybe I think you would agree that what we really need, guys, is a single vaccine, one vaccine to rule them all, a pan-genotypic immunization against flu and a pan-genotypic immunization against COVID or coronaviruses. I'm not convinced that such a thing can be done, but there's been pursuit of a single lifetime once and done flu shot uh, to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars. People are trying this. No one has yet succeeded, so I'm not holding out hope. Hey, thank you so much. Um, so our next question is, do you remember the moment you found out about the very first COVID case? And did you expect the disease to have the impact that it has had today? Yeah, I, I do. I was, um, 
I was riding in a van uh, going to climb a mountain called um, Chimborazo, which is the tallest mountain in Ecuador. Um, and we had a little bit of 3G signal, and I saw that. And I told my friends in the van, this is just not going to be a thing. I promise you this is no big deal. Um, it's going to flame out. This is probably coronavirus. It's probably like SARS-1. I'm not worried about it. It'll be too deadly to spread. And uh, so I was completely wrong about that. My expectations were incorrect. I don't think I'm alone, but yeah, I was certainly not right about that. All right, yeah, thank you for the honesty. Uh, our next question is, is there any legitimate evidence that suggests COVID-19 may have been artificially created in a laboratory? Yeah, thanks. So yeah, there is some evidence um, that, um, and I wouldn't say artificially created, but that, again, this so-called gain of function research may have led to the great-great-grandfather, the ancestor of what we see here today a year ago. So there's some, um, <clears throat> It would be super helpful if we could have access to those uh, specimens uh, that they were working with in the lab. The way to answer that question would be to go back to their stocks, if they're all well curated, line them up, sequence them, and see what those changes are. Um, what we can say is that uh, there's tremendous similarity to what we see today in humans to some of the lineages from bat specimens from a thousand kilometers away or more, a completely different part of China, and that some of those specimens were brought to to this viral virology research center funded in part by us in the US um, I think it was a good idea because we really need to be closely linked to Chinese CDC viruses don't care about our political boundaries we need to cooperate with each other and share information when things go off the rails it's when things go rogue so when something is done in secret whether that's for political aspirations uh, for militarization or weaponization or or just for pride or hubris or whatever reason. When scientists don't talk to each other, that's when we get into trouble. That's why I cannot answer your question. There is circumstantial evidence to say this, but at the moment, definitely not definitive. And a lot of my colleagues feel that this is more likely to be just a good old zoonosis, meaning spread between humans and animals, without any artificial uh, monkeying around in science. We may find an answer to your question, but I'm not sure we will. I think it's such a hot-button topic that the government, not the scientists, but the government in China, their central government is so weak and afraid that they just don't want to share that information with the world. I think they're embarrassed about it. Put another way, if there was nothing to hide, why are they hiding? That's my common sense answer to your good scientific question. Thank you. Um, our other question is, what kind of safety measures need to be present in factory work? environments to ensure respiratory health. Yeah, I was thinking about, thank you, I was thinking about that with respect to factories uh, for meat processing, but the same with the chips for your phones and such. So one, today, that answer is really easy. Everybody's immunized with a well-studied, legit immunization that, again, has open source data that's been approved by a thoughtful group of of experts, not just pushed out from Russia, from Putin's butt because he wants things to look good, but actually do the trial. So if we have legit immunizations, that should be required. Uh, and then of course, uh, that whole list of things that I mentioned before, no one comes to work if they're sick, no one comes to work if they think they've been exposed. Everybody has good, well-tolerated face coverings to reduce their spread, not only of COVID, by the way, but flu and rhinovirus and all the other shit that usually slows people down, and that the area is kept clean, not just surfaces, but the air. For these airborne infections, there needs to be copious fresh air. If you could move your factory outdoors, you'd be good, right? Eh, probably hard to do. So instead, have good air handling, like what we see on a commercial airliner. The highly efficient particle air, or HEPA air filters, that are constantly sucking out the air, getting rid of the vi viruses and other particles, and then feeding people back the air. If people have high quality air to breathe, the masks are almost not necessary. They are at the moment, but almost not necessary. Good question. All right, thank you. Um, so our next question is, um, certainly there's gonna be like a psychological impact from the pandemic amongst the general public, but how do you feel this will affect or has already affected the mental health of healthcare workers? 
I think everybody has been, anybody who has a conscience <laughs> and a soul, whatever you want to call it, people who are compassionate people are all traumatized by this. That's not only healthcare workers. For the healthcare worker, the challenge is that, you know, we do the work we do because we like to take care of people. To see that person as a threat to your health, that's a very complicated situation, more so in the current context when the infection is essentially preventable. I mean, they really, it should disappear from the face of our planet in the blink of an eye. If everybody did what they were supposed to do by masking up, getting their shot, then in two weeks, COVID-19 would be done, at least in the U.S. And so, so not only do, I, do we take care of people who um, are a threat to our own health and safety, but, but they shouldn't do that because they should have gotten their goddamn shot. I mean, the number of people in our hospital today who are immunized is basically zero. There are a handful of people who are elderly. They're very immunosuppressed because they're fighting cancer or some other significant immunologic disorder. The vaccine doesn't work for them. So they may be exposed no fault of their own. We take care of people, I wanna be clear, we take care of people regardless of their skin color, regardless of what they've done to themselves. A significant number of my patients uh, are living with opiate use disorder. Uh, that is a self-inflicted disease, and it's very difficult for us to deal with. It's very frustrating. We do it. We do it for people who don't believe in vaccines and come in and get COVID, too. It's the, it's the volume. It's the consistency. It's month after month. We're now into our second year of this, and that has just been very, very difficult for our teams to do, to muster up the empathy to take care of that person. I think most of us feel, he's speaking on behalf of myself and the colleagues I've talked to about this, most of us are more or less on empty for our empathy. And that's very, very disturbing because if you are a physician and you don't care about that person, that's, that's a very frightening situation. Com for me, completely unprecedented. I've taken care of people with the swastikas tattooed on their chest. Somebody I would never have in, in normal life I had nothing to do with those people. In the context of healthcare, this is what we do. It's actually a point of pride for us that we can put our personal beliefs aside and lay hands on somebody. And we do it because of that firm belief that got us into medicine in the first place, that people can change. I mean, if you don't believe that people can change, you absolutely should not go into medicine because otherwise you're stuck in your own memes, your own fixed beliefs. So I can change, and my hope is that these people can too. I think that's true as well for COVID. I do. And I've seen people make change. But I would say it is really hard. Really hard. And then for people outside of healthcare, um, I think it's a similar situation where we're just so split into different fractured groups in our society. It's just the wrong way. It is not the way we can make, make progress moving forward. So I don't know what it takes to get over my disillusionment, my disenchantment, whatever you want to call it. But I'm working on it. Uh, I think I need a vacation. It would be good. Have a day or three or four months off. That would be helpful. And just detoxify. And then getting people back off of Zoom. Lovely to be connected to all of you, but I'd much rather be there with you in person. I'm sick of Zoom. So that'd be another moral injury that I'm ready to get rid of as well. But beyond that, I, I would love to hear from all of you how to deal with the nightmares, right? We have dental care issues where people have ground their teeth down. So much dental care where people are gnashing their teeth at night out of anxiety, anger, fear, rage, etc. So I think the country has been traumatized. Mark my words, there will be a mortality. There already is a mortality impact, not just from COVID, but people dying of heart attacks, cancers, suicide. These numbers are up. Homicide is up. We are an unwell, unbalanced society. We have to get it back. We have a chance. There's no reason we can't. We have a real president now. There's, there's ways we can move forward. It's just, um, it needs to be done mindfully, uh, almost with a pastoral view to things. And I'm a devout atheist, but I, I don't know what the next thing is going to be to move it forward. But it's going to be on you. So thanks for your patience with us old people. We really screwed this up for you guys, and um, some of us are trying to dig it out, but we'll do it with your help. I think it's that togetherness, this kind of connection, that's a big part of the healing process for me as well. Yeah, definitely, thank you. So our next question is, what impact does universal healthcare have on the development of the pandemic? Yeah, I wish we, wish we had that. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> uh, you know, 
I'm an academic. I take, I'm a professor, so I take care of people regardless of their skin color. I don't get paid much, but, but I know that I can go to work, take care of people, and not have to worry about all that stuff. So that, for me, was intentional for this exact reason. Of course, I'm, I just I cannot understand how we do not have good health care for our population. The fact that we spend more on health care than any other industry and the fact that we have so many people dying of these preventable deaths, it's crazy. I don't know the answer, but I think when the model is, you're sick, pay me, that won't work. How about, I kept you healthy, give me an incentive. Focusing on disease instead of wellness won't work. So I don't know what the answer is. I think that what works in Canada would not work here. What works in the UK doesn't work very well in the UK, would never be acceptable. But we should at least have the conversation. In my opinion, the fatal flaw is to link employment to health care. I just, I don't get that. I never have. Um, even Kaiser figured this out. Kaiser doesn't even make aluminum anymore. They just do healthcare. Even Flip and Kaiser could figure this out. So why we can't understand that as a society, I don't know. Uh, I think it's the same reason why education, teachers, professors are not considered to be sources of truth. Why is it that education and healthcare are not at the top? No, it's financial services that's at the top. And so it's a, it's a problem. Uh, fraying of our moral fabric, and I don't know how to fix those moral wrongs. If we had universal health care, would we be going through what we went through? You know, the virus remains a threat, but there are so many people who did not perceive themselves to be connected to a physician, to have high-quality information. It's about trust in the medical establishment. Universal health care is part of that. I think if people knew they could go to the doctor and get good care, then we'd be in a better position, put it that way. Anything you guys can do to move that conversation forward, I, I would be so appreciative. Our next question is, have you ever served on the FDA review panel for any of the vaccines? Yeah, no, I don't, although uh, many of my colleagues do. That's called the advise. There's two panels. There's CDC and FDA. The CDC panel is called the Advisory Council for Immunization Practices, ACIP, and then the FDA has its own subgroups. So a number of my colleagues here at UW are on both of those. Uh, I've not, although I'd be happy to if I were so asked. The FDA group is very scientific. Uh, they're looking at the evidence, the information as reported by the manufacturer, looking for safety and some for effectiveness as well. CDC's group says, okay, based on what the FDA has found, how do we recommend we use these drugs? So they, it's a partnership. They do work well together. Our system for public health and pharmaceutical control is the best in the world. It's a problem. We've made mistakes. You may have read about this crazy situation with an Alzheimer's drug that was approved just a week or two ago. It's a mistake. Flat out. doesn't work, and it's going to cost us $20 trillion. It's a, that's a screw-up on the FDA's part. And in fact, a number of people have now resigned their post in protest. So um, and in spite of that. In spite of the bad press you'll see with that, it remains a superb twin pillars of FDA and CDC. I trust them. They are very smart people. They're my colleagues here. So in general, if you hear something come from FDA or CDC, I believe it. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, um, are mRNA vaccines overhyped because they're novelty? Um, one of um, our members said that I um, heard that the new Novavax traditional vaccine is better in efficacy and has less side effects than Pfizer and Moderna, but it's not getting the same coverage. Yeah, it's funny. We were, great question. We were a registry uh, trial site for all of those trials, including Novavax, which worked well and was well tolerated in our, in our hands here. Uh, it was, of course, a multi-center site. I was really encouraged to see that Novavax finally, finally, published their data. It's a new company. It's not just a Novavax. They're a Nova company. They really are not up to playing with the big dogs. And so they've been slow on the stick. But Novavax is, remember, a protein vaccine. What's new or Nova about it is that they have morselated those protein fragments and packaged them in a, apparently a proprietary way that I actually don't fully understand. But I'm very hopeful about this because 
look, are they overhyped? I don't know how to answer that question. They have saved our society. I mean, they're amazing. And they hold promise for the future so that they can rapidly pivot. To me, the beauty of mRNA vaccines is their modular nature and the fact that they can change quickly. The downside to proteins is that you got to make that protein. You guys understand what crystallography looks like, how to do structural work to actually build a protein to do what you want it to do. Uh, this is heroic work, and it has saved many lives. It's exciting. That's what drug exploration and drug discovery does. That's what I used to do in my previous life, making new molecules, proteins to stop the spread of malaria. So I have great respect for it. It's hard work, and you have to have a real expertise to make it go well. Some of you here, I bet, would be terrific at it. mRNA is easy. You just plug it in. It comes out. It's quick. And so to be able to pivot to COVID-2022 or whenever our next COVID is going to be, it will be mRNA that makes the difference there. The downside is that it's harder to work with in deployment. They're more fragile. They're more delicate. Protein vaccines are tougher. They're more hardy. If we think about our colleagues in India, what they're going through today, which is, at least for me, inconceivable, the horrors that are there, that needs to be a protein vaccine. And in fact, Dr. Peter Hotez, one of my colleagues who's at Houston, Texas, is working on this with a company in uh, India to make a protein vaccine that's tough, it's hardy. The adjuvant is old school alum. It's a simple adjuvant that really gets a good immune response. That will save a lot of lives. The mRNA stuff is hard to scale, hard to work with. So for us as an affluent society in the US, mRNA, I'm all about it. On a global perspective, major shortcomings with it, and I think X-ray crystallography protein structure is still an extremely valuable part of technology moving forward for drugs uh, and for vaccines. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, do we know if there are any late onset symptoms of the vaccine, such as developing cancer in 10 years as an extreme example? Yeah, no, we've only, we by definition, no, uh, because we've only had the vaccine out since uh, December. I think I got my shot day after Christmas. So we are now, um, what is this, almost, yeah, we're about seven months in. That is literally the limit of our scientific knowledge. So we have to admit that our safety understanding is limited by time. But as scientists, we can make some leaps of faith. Number one, we know that the, the infection is deadly. Uh, I get this question a lot, actually, about fertility as well. Young women who are interested in having kids currently or in the near future, will this impact their fertility? And I always say to them, so number one, no, there's no reason to think that it would. There's no scientific link there. Number two, we have looked at people who are pregnant when they've been immunized. There's never been a case of uh, concern for fetal malformations or decreased fertility. Number three, we know that if you're pregnant and get COVID, you have at least a doubling of your chance of dying. Pregnancy is a relatively immunosuppressed state. So that's pioneering work here in Washington state. COVID plus pregnancy, you're more likely to die. Finally, among our male colleagues who are interested in fertility, pay this one forward. This was just published a few days ago. Um, they're worried about their sperm count, right? People are, men are interested in their own sperm for some reason. Well, we know that COVID-19 substantially drops sperm count and that people with COVID may be much more likely to have erectile dysfunction or sexual dysfunction after COVID. People with the vaccine, in some cases, their sperm count went up. And it certainly was not adversely impacted. I think this needs to get picked up. We tell men that their sperm count will rise with the vaccine. I bet we'll be over with this whole stupid pandemic in a, in a matter of days. But no, to answer your question, for cancer, well, the specific question, no reason to think that it would do because it's just not the way the mRNA uh, will work. Cancer remains a huge threat. Uh, it's the way that most Americans will die, that or a heart attack or stroke. But this will not be the thing we think that would drive that uh, to be worse. Thank you. Um, our next question is, why didn't researchers notice the myocarditis side effects during its clinical trials? Yeah, myocarditis and pericarditis. So, so everybody's clear about this. Myocarditis, myo means muscle, card means heart, itis means inflammation. So inflammation of the muscle of the heart. And we've seen myocarditis and also pericarditis. That's the, the shrink wrap wrapping around the heart uh, as well. And these are great examples uh, of things that only come out in phase four, which is post-approval use, because they're so incredibly rare. Um, 
you know, to get to approval, you need to have a certain number of thousands of um, people who've been through the process. And FDA says, ooh, this looks safe. But they do that knowing full well that there may be rare issues that are so uncommon that they're not going to show up unless we, well, unless we did trials for much longer. So that's the balancing act for FDA and CDC to say that in the trial, things look effective, efficacious, and safe, but knowing that there may be other issues that come down the pike. Similar issue with respect to blood clots. There's an extraordinarily rare, much more rare than myocarditis, issue of blood clots with the Johnson & Johnson product. Uh, in fact, somebody has actually died that way. One person, to my knowledge, who's ever received that vaccine. Whereas with the myocarditis cases, you know, this is a very real association. We've seen it in Israel. We've seen it in the United States. It's here in our practice in Seattle. And these patients do okay. It's a generalized inflammation um, of the joints, of the muscles. It's probably no surprise that this happens. Thankfully, those people have come through fine. I was really worried that there might be severe cases where people would have dysfunction of the heart. It's been relatively mild, easy to treat, and people have gotten through. But to answer your question, it's just a numbers game. It was just simply too soon for us to have seen them. Because although we have more of them, they remain very, very rare. Thank you. Um, so our next question is, um, do you know any healthcare workers that are anti-mask or anti-vaccine? What are your opinions on it? <laughs> we're all anti-mask because we all have to wear a mask 24-7 when we're at work. We hate it. So um, the mask part is interesting. No, that part, everyone at our hospital is, man, I'm working from my home office today, as you can see. Every, at the hospital, you're masked. And that is true and will remain true for the foreseeable future. Even once the mask mandates have gone away nationwide, which I think does happen on Independence Day. So it's interesting to me. On the mask side, no, that part's been fine. I don't know of anybody who has left our hospital because they didn't want to wear a mask. And most people do wear it properly. They don't do the Kilroy or the Abe Lincoln. They really do wear the, where the mask is they're meant to. On the other hand, vaccines, it's a challenge. There, yes, there are a small number of people who work in healthcare, including at my university, who ha have not yet been immunized. And this comes at us again for different reasons. You mentioned anti-vax. There are some people who are philosophically opposed. They just don't like the idea. Uh, those people will no longer work at my hospital. They are small in number. I think the much greater opportunity are people who just aren't yet fully educated on this. That's not just nurses. I don't know any doctors or nurses who are like this, but it could be. But that's, that's our service workers. That's the people who make the hospital run. Engineers, environmental service workers, dietary. Many of them have come to the U.S. as first generation. For many of them, English is not their first language. For most of them, they do not come from a scientifically literate family. Um, and they were not trained this way. So they have confusion and fear, in some cases, about the vaccine. Because some of the news sources that they look at have been telling them that this is unsafe. And so they need help from us to discern what is a reliable source of truth versus what is hokum. Uh, and although to you and me, this is so obviously easy to tell, um, QAnon, not a thing, but for them, it's a problem. So we have to do this work. It's hard work. Uh, it has to be done in their language, on their turf, on their terms with the people who they respect standing with us side by side. That could be a spiritual leader, that could be a community leader. You know, people have been looking at people like me, a white guy on TV. I think I've reached my audience. Like, I, my capital is spent. Either people are going to listen to me or they're not. I am not going to be able to fix this. I need people who, if someone, you know, speaks Hmong as their first uh, language, then that's, that's, we need to do that work. Uh, many people come to Seattle from Pacific Rim, uh, and we're, we love having them here. They're amazing. Uh, but for some of them, we have to do that educational work. And I, I think it's something that um, we should have done a long time ago. I think COVID has just brought to the surface the disconnect and really neglect on our part in elevating scientific literacy among everybody who works in our hospital. And I don't care if somebody's a carpenter or a heart surgeon. They should all have firm faith in the science that we bring. And if they don't, I don't want them working for me. I mean, if somebody literally hears my pitch and they don't believe what I say, then I want them out. Because I don't want a nurse who's going to have philosophical pause. Do I give this antibiotic or is it against my philosophy? I mean, either you believe in science or you don't. But we can't make that determination rashly. It has to be done with great humility 
and cultural appropriateness and openness. So much mistrust in certain ethnic groups within our country against the medical establishment. I mean, there, there have been some bad times in the past, and including not the so distant past. <laughs> Look who just used to be our president. So you can, there's, I, I don't blame people if they don't just take me for granted for what I say, but we have to have a conversation. And if at the end of that process people aren't uh, on board, then they need to go. Yeah, that's a very, very small minority, I would think. Thank you. Our next question is, are there any ways to reduce political polarization as activists and healthcare workers try to achieve equity in healthcare systems? I hope so. I mean, I, this is a huge opportunity and mandate. I think we must. <laughs> I think it happens in a variety of different ways. In some cases, heavy-handed legislation from above. In many cases, I would assume that the way to move forward are the human connections that we have within our informal communities, social networks, connecting with friends and family and telling our stories. We're a nation of storytelling. That's what Instagram is. It's telling a story. It's just one little gram at a time. That's a story, and I think that we need to do the same. It's fascinating that conspiracy theories and untruths, lies, they spread nine times, you probably know this, there's ninefold power of lie to truth. And I don't know why that is. But this has been studied, I'm told, <laughs> I guess it's true, uh, by social scientists who have found that conspiracy theories are much more quick to spread and much tougher to unroot. So, and, and yet the truth is what it is. And so, to me, to answer your question, I think this has to happen not only from the top, but among social networks where people tell their truth. All of you today, for example, if you have an IG account, you can talk about your thoughts on this process. I think we should not be, as scientifically minded humans, we should not be a silent majority. We should be very vocal. And I think it's a big shortcoming within the scientific community that we, myself, we've been so shy about this. We've always thought of ourselves as pure and above the fray, that the science is what it is. It is the data don't lie. Uh, and that we can just rely on science to move things forward. It's completely false. <laughs> it is wrong, and we have killed hundreds of thousands of Americans because of our silence. So I think we should be active, we should be vocal, we should be humble, and we should be clear. Communicating science and communicating our beliefs, these should be one and the same. And there is no training model for that, not really. In medical school, I was not trained how to get on TV and talk to people on Fox News. I just wasn't trained to do that. I've had to figure it out on the way. There was no social media. It wasn't even really an internet when I was in medical school. So I, I don't have a clue how to answer that question. But I do sense that that's going to be the way to make it go. Human to human connection uh, and telling things that are honest and, and true. And you will pay a price when you do. I just want to put that out there, that no one who speaks their truth goes unscathed. I've had death threats and hate, hate mail as well, and it, I hate that. And um, it doesn't bug me as much as it does some others. My dad was an attorney. He ran civil rights, he desegregated the Boston school system. I mean, the Ku Klux Klan hunted him down. Uh, so I'm used to this, thinking about these issues of race and just standing up, speaking your truth. But I, I would just say, if you do, be ready for people to throw shade at you, especially nowadays on social media where people just do anonymous comments and all that stuff. Just brush it off. You know what you're doing. Be firm, be humble, uh, be evidence-based, and be compassionate. I think that's a good way forward. We also need to be tough with the election laws and all these ways they're trying to get people of color from not voting. I mean, that needs to stop, right? That's a regulatory thing that will help to bring us together, I hope. But I don't know. I'm eager to see how this goes over the next few decades, what happens. We're at a turning point. Either we fix this problem or we don't. And if we don't, we won't make it. We'll fracture. Um, China will eat our lunch and we'll be in, in huge trouble. Yeah. Thank you. Um, our next question is, what impact did the presidential election have on the current vaccine rollout as well as the trajectory of the COVID-19 development in the U.S.? Yeah, thank you. So remember, the vaccine was developed under the leadership of the previous administration, so they get huge props for that. They undersold it and they didn't get the vaccine and they told people they didn't work, but at least they gave some of us with the open mind the idea that we could actually do it. So um, so I think it's everything. That's huge that we have a science-focused 
administration. I mean, it, you know, you're going to see funding of the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Health. That funding will rise. CDC will get more funding. We have to, obviously. And again, if you'd like more of my thoughts on that topic, that book I mentioned to you called um, The Plague Year, it's all about that question. So I'd, I'd love to know that some of you would consider reading it or listening to it, getting it from the library. Um, thank you. So um, our next question is, how have governments regulated spread of misinformation about COVID-19? How have governments regulated that spread of? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, our country is a perfect example of what not to do, <laughs> right? If you think about some of our superb scientists, Dr. Deborah Birx, for example, is very, very honorable, good person sitting there next to the president who's saying, I'm just going to drink bleach or shine ultraviolet light down my throat. Don't get the vaccine, stop the testing, all the things. It's a hoax, it'll go away by summer, all the lies. So I think you need to have science and policymakers lined up. Every pandemic is political. That's not unique to COVID-19. It's always like that, always. HIV was this way, right? Think about the way the Reagans mishandled that problem. Um, but so I don't think that's unique to where we are today, but that's a perfect example of why you cannot have experts and morons saying different things. It just won't work. I think that could we have cut the death rate to zero? No. Dr. Burks herself has said we were probably in for 100,000 dead. That the first 100,000, that first wave of dead Americans was probably more or less inevitable. Scientifically, that's not true, but in the context of the way that the world was working back in 2019 with air travel and all of this, we were probably, you know, we probably can be forgiven for 100,000 dead. But the next half million is explicitly because of this issue, because of mixed messages, misinformation, and just lies. I don't know why we call it misinformation. Lies coming from, from the podium at the White House that have killed so many of these people, many of whom have voted for that person. You know, there are patients who are dying of COVID-19 in the ICU, and their last words before they drown in their own secretions is, this is a hoax. I have patients who are kept alive on a heart-lung machine where the blood is taken out of the body, oxygenated, then pushed back in, and the patient finally gives up because it's such a terrible way to be hooked up. You know, we turn off the machine and the blood literally drains from their body. They turn to a corpse in front of their family, and, you know, turning to that husband who, standing with his 11-year-old son, is watching his wife turn into a corpse. Will you now get the vaccine? No, we don't believe in that. So there are some, <laughs> there are some issues where, you know, some people are tuned into listening to the lies and you cannot budge them. They will not change. And I think you just have to be willing to say these people are not going to make it. And I'm, I'm heartbroken for that, but I can't spend my precious energy on them. Would those people have felt that way if the president hadn't said what he said? I don't know. We will never tell. The point is we have an opportunity to move it forward and for people to, uh, to start listening to science. I think we need to model it. And for those of you here today, you are looking at careers in science. You'll model this moving forward. The idea that a scientist can also do something that is socially responsible, fulfilling to themselves, good for society, whatever that means, writ large, whether it's health science, biological science, physical science, that we're all in it together. If that doesn't change people's mind, I don't know what will. But yes, I think there's a huge tragedy in the way misinformation and lies were spread from the last administration. Thank you. And we just have a few more questions for today. So our next question is, when should we expect the rest of the world to catch up vaccine-wise? And how should countries with those vaccines ramp up exportation? Yeah, I'm really concerned about India and all of Sub-Saharan Africa. Again, because the vaccines that we currently have that are mRNA-based are difficult to build at large scale. We need billions of doses. It's not clear to me that the United States can make a huge dent in terms of donating our vaccines overseas, which, by the way, we have done and need to do much more of. Americans are not going to get more vaccines. The numbers of immunizations are tapering off. So we need to send everything we have overseas. I mean, I think that's clear. But I think we also need to really refresh the scientific investment in these countries to help them to build their own vaccines 
not political bullshit, but legit vaccines. I mentioned Dr. Hotez, what he's doing with his protein vaccine with colleagues in India. For those who don't know, India has really fabulous um, pharmaceutical industry. Renbaxi is one of those companies, there are others. So I'm excited for that. I think the biggest thing we can do is to try to model it so that people overseas believe in vaccines. That's why it really hurts me when only half of us have been immunized. It makes us look bad to others. That sucks, and uh, I, I don't like that idea that we would say, well, it's not good enough for us, but you people in other countries should get this vaccine. That's a bad look. But I think we need to share data, we need to model it, and we need to help to fund that work for the building of capacity in other countries. For the future, my vision is that we have regional or national capacities so that every country can do this on their own. They shouldn't depend on us because we apparently kind of suck at this, right? Every country needs to have its own ability to do, to do that work. But yes, I agree that we should donate as much as we can overseas as quickly as we can. Every life saved is a good one. Thank you. Um, our next question is, what is herd Im the herd immunity threshold for COVID-19 in our world? And is it possible for human herd immunity to be successful given the multitude of people who refuse to get vaccinated? Yeah, thank you. Um, herd immunity typically refers to people who are getting sick without a vaccine and then spreading it to others and then not being able to spread it to others still. It comes from rinderpest, which is measles for cows. Killed every cow in Africa about 100, 110 years ago. And so this idea of get the herd immune. So um, yeah, no, I think it's pretty clear that that is partially what's happening in some of these other societies, parts of the Midwest, other areas where people are not getting immunized. What we're seeing again is that these communities are very, very hard hit. I'm thinking about southwestern Missouri in particular, that hot spot we talked about. You'll see these little fires pop up like a wildfire model from time to time, and then it will then taper down. So some people will have uh, partial immunity or short-lived immunity after they are sick. You can get COVID twice. The only thing worse than COVID is the second COVID. The only thing worse than that is third COVID. So people are getting these repeated cases. What's the threshold? Nobody knows. It just depends on those individual situations, how many people are masking. If you're in a heavily masked area, then herd immunity is easy to get. If people aren't masked, then it's much tougher. It's the question that we hope never to answer, right? Because there's no reason to answer it. Everybody should be immunized. And yet, we'll see. I think in the coming months, you'll see articles in the scientific literature talking about uh, the comparison of here's a vaccinated uh, community, here's an unvaccinated community, looking at the death rates, etc. Um, at the moment, I'm not sure what that number is. We've talked about 70%. For the individual who gets sick, for no good reason, it's cold comfort, put it that way. Thank you. Um, I think this is our last question. Um, so how did you decide on your career path and what got you interested in infectious diseases specifically? Yeah, thanks, a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I think it was multiple different things. When I went to medical school, uh, and I don't come from a medical family, so I, I had no real preconceived notions about it. I thought I would be a surgeon. I thought I would do neurology, something in medical genetics. I just didn't know. But what drew me to infectious disease was those, those are my favorite cases. Those are my favorite professors. Those are the cases that just called to me. And I think that's important that we, can I rationalize this looking backwards? Yes, it's incredibly fulfilling. I mean, it's a good fit for me. Rationally, it makes sense, but it was not a rational choice. I actually fought it because I wanted to do something with my hands. I like to build things. I like to operate on people. Infectious disease didn't do any of that. But what it does have is just this endless fascination. You will be called, each of you will be called to the thing that calls you. And you may do that very intentionally. You may know today what it's going to be, and that may carry you till you're 100 years old. But be willing to pivot to change and listen to your inner happy voice. If there's something that makes you happy, um, explore it. If there's a professor who you connect with and you say, I'm not interested in that person. They seem cool. I want to learn more about them. Talk to them. Your professors should all be very accessible, available. Teachers love to teach. And so talk to them. Go to coffee virtually or otherwise. See what drives people. Have those conversations. For me, it was not a single decision. It was a more gradual process. And I think that's true for a lot of people who do infectious disease. We do it because we can't imagine doing anything else. 
Okay, I think that is all the time we have for today. Um, we are hitting right up at the hour. But I just wanted to personally say thank you so much. I really enjoyed your whole presentation and all of those questions. Um, if we could, everybody, give him a nice big round of applause, please. There we go. We've got it going. Um, I did have one quick question for you. Would it be okay if I were to send you a list of some of the questions we did not have a chance to get to? Yeah, sure. That's fine. I may not get to them for a couple of days, but uh, no problem. <clears throat> that's fine. We have got our participants here until the end of July, so that's fine. I think some of them would really look forward to seeing an answer to some of those follow-up questions. Um, but again, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking your time to meet with us for two whole hours today um, you know, before you go in and go to your other job. So. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's very my pleasure to be connected with all of you. You're very impressive, and um, I do this because I enjoy it, but I also do it because I really want to get to meet the next generation of inspiring people, and um, thank you for that, and to your faculty, all your teachers who are putting in so much time to go through this with you. Be well, stay safe, and um, let's keep in touch. I'd like that. All right. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, folks.